Ever stumbled upon a gem of a movie that leaves you with a whirlwind of emotions? Picture yourself transported into the heart of a beatnik cafe, where a busboy turned artist takes his passion to extreme measures. Throughout the film, various characters contribute to the rich tapestry of the story, each adding layers to its depth. As you delve into the tale, you'll find yourself drawn to particular characters, perhaps wondering which one resonates with you the most. From the protagonist's journey to the quirky regulars of the cafe, each plays a vital role in shaping the narrative. Yet, what's truly remarkable is how this movie prompts deep reflection and sparks conversations about art, society, and ethics. Have you ever watched a film that made you ponder life's bigger questions? As you immerse yourself in the unfolding drama, share your memories and experiences in the comments below. Whether it's a funny anecdote or a poignant realization, your voice adds to the collective experience of enjoying this timeless classic. So kick back, relax, and brace yourself for an emotional roller coaster with this unforgettable cinematic journey. And remember, there's plenty more surprises waiting to be discovered. In the late 1950s, a film emerged that left an indelible mark on cinema, blending horror and comedy in a way that captivated audiences. Directed by Roger Corman, it tells the tale of a waiter turned accidental artist after a bizarre twist of fate involving a dead cat. This unique blend of humor and horror has influenced many films that followed, shaping the evolution of the horror comedy genre. Its satirical take on the art world and exploration of the desire for fame still strike a chord with viewers today. The central character's journey from obscurity to unexpected success resonates with audiences, serving as a timeless symbol of the underdog's rise. The movie's themes of societal pressures and the consequences of ambition remain relevant, offering a deeper commentary on human nature. In essence, this film remains a cult classic and a testament to the power of blending genres to explore profound themes. Its enduring appeal and continued relevance ensure its place as a cinematic gem that transcends its original release. In the film, Anthony Carbone portrays a character who limps and uses a cane throughout the story. Surprisingly, Carbone was not injured. He intentionally adopted this characteristic to add depth to his role. The sets used in the movie were later repurposed for Roger Corman's next project, The Little Shop of Horrors. Prior to that, they were featured in The Diary of a High School Bride. Remarkably, the entire film was shot in just five days with a modest budget of $50,000. Dollar, it's a testament to the efficiency of the production process. These factors combined contribute to the unique charm of the movie. When American International Pictures approached Roger Corman to direct a horror film, they provided a small budget and a tight schedule. Corman, disinterested in a traditional horror flick, teamed up with screenwriter Charles B. Griffith to create a black comedy instead. Bert Convey, known for his appearances on The Love Boat, married Ann Anderson in 1959, with whom he had three children. After their separation, he battled a malignant brain tumor and formed a relationship with Catherine Hills. Despite health struggles, Burke found happiness with Catherine and they married in 1991. His funeral, attended by celebrities like Burt Reynolds and Sally Struthers, took place later that year. Convey appeared on The Love Boat seven times and in a two-part crossover episode, Love Boat Angels, showcasing his talent and charm on the popular TV series. In the late 1950s, a movie came out that took people on a dark and mysterious journey. This movie had a unique story that unfolded against the backdrop of Burke Convey's early life. Convey grew up in the San Fernando Valley and was known as the funny kid in school. He went to UCLA with Carol Burnett, who would later become a famous comedian. Years later, in 2002, the film was released on DVD in Finland after getting approval from the censors. The DVD cover hinted at the scary story inside, with comic strip art showing bits of the plot. Once people started watching the movie, they were drawn into its eerie world. The mix of dark humor and twisted storyline made it stand out as something memorable in cinema history. This movie left a lasting impression on those who dared to watch it. In 1971, Burt Convey was set to star in The Poppies of Hell, directed by Patris Rome. Filming commenced on September 22, 1971 in Yugoslavia, but was abruptly suspended on October 6, 1971. Despite plans to resume in March 1972, there is no evidence that the film was ever completed. Ed Nelson, known for portraying Harry's Truman in a one-man Turing production of Give Him Hell Harry, held political views contrary to his role as he was a Republican. His family background included English and some Scottish descent from his father's side, while his mother's ancestry traced back to France. 
These intriguing tidbits about Bert Convey's stall project and Ed Nelson's political stance and diverse heritage add layers to their personas beyond the silver screen. In a bucket of blood, Bert Convey, a member of the 1950s pop group The Cheers, contributed to the film's soundtrack, showcasing his musical talents. His earlier success with hits like black denim trousers and motorcycle boots adds depth to his involvement in the movie. The line referencing Walter Paisley's knowledge of anatomy serves as a subtle homage to House of Wax, featuring Vincent Price, who later became a favorite of Roger Corman. Ed Nelson's connection to Esta Hansen as his father-in-law adds a personal dimension to the film's production. In a surprising turn, Bert Convey filled in for Raoul Julia during his break from the original Broadway production of Nine at the 46th St. Theater. Maxwell's line, and no one knows that Duncan is murdered, and no one knows that Walter Paisley is born, refers to the end of King Duncan and Shakespeare's Macbeth. Moreover, Bert Convey was supposed to host the new match game on ABC, but got sick, leading to Ross Schaefer taking over. In a single day, Roger Corman and Charles B. Griffith conceptualized and outlined the film. Despite Dick Miller's appreciation for the script and performances, he expressed dissatisfaction with the budget constraints affecting the film's potential, particularly evident in the underwhelming makeup effects at the conclusion. Bert Convey, known for his roles in Broadway musicals like Fiddler on the Roof and Cabaret, saw his characters transformed into non-singing roles for the cinema adaptations. These insights shed light on the creative process and challenges faced during the production of the film. In 1990, his health took a serious turn when he collapsed while visiting his mother. Doctors discovered a brain tumor, leading to a challenging battle for recovery. Despite undergoing various treatments, he unfortunately passed away on July 15, 1991. He was laid to rest in Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills Cemetery. In several films such as Hollywood Boulevard, The Howling, Twilight Zone, The Movie, and Chopping Mall, he was portrayed by Dick Miller. He made his stage debut in 1952 at UCLA, appearing in a silent role in Moliere's The Imaginary Invalid. Exploring the cast members' diverse talents adds depth to the story behind this classic film. One actor, known for his skills both on screen and on the baseball field, played for the Philadelphia Phillies minor league teams in the 1950s. Another cast member shared fascinating insights in an interview featured in a book by Tom Weaver. This behind-the-scenes look offers a unique perspective on the collaborative effort that brought the movie to life. Beyond its initial release, the film continues to make an impact. In 2009, a theater in Chicago staged a musical adaptation, showcasing the movie's enduring influence and appeal. Through these various reinterpretations and contributions, it's clear that the movie's significance goes beyond just its storyline. In summary, the diverse talents and backgrounds of the cast, along with creative reinterpretations of the movie, contribute to its rich history. It's not just about the narrative, it's about the people and the creativity that brought it to life. In 2005, Ed Nelson joined the Western Film Fair in Charlotte, N.C., alongside fellow actors Ty Harden, Donna Douglas, Richard Anderson, Elena Verdugo, Adrian Bryan, Henry Darrow, and Joe Morrow. Interestingly, Ed Nelson and Barbara Parkins shared a Peyton Place connection, appearing in the first and final episodes in 1964 and 1969, respectively. They were the only actors credited for every episode during the show's five-year run. Dick Miller, a seasoned actor with an extensive filmography, played a prominent role in A Bucket of Blood, one of three films where he held a leading position. His versatility shines in this movie, showcasing a different facet of his career. Ed Nelson's consistent presence in Peyton Place, alongside Barbara Parkins, emphasizes the enduring connections between actors and television. In summary, Ed Nelson's diverse roles and Peyton Place connection, along with Dick Miller's standout performance in A Bucket of Blood, highlight the intertwined nature of actors in the world of television and film. Two films from the late 1950s often confused audiences before the era of video and streaming. Both starred Dick Miller and featured Myrtle Vale as the mother, with a similar kooky jazz score. Each depicted a dim-witted protagonist who gains sudden fame, but resorts to murder to maintain it. Preview audiences chuckled when Maxwell appeared in a tuxedo and sandals as it suited the character, but it was actually because Julian Burton had swollen feet from wearing the sandals constantly. Bert Convey, a well-known face in the Pacific Palisades, lived in the area for years before his death. In the late 1950s, a unique cinematic creation emerged, eventually becoming known as one of the first slasher films in history. The movie, characterized by a darkly comedic tone, broke new ground in the world of cinema. 
Amidst the ensemble of celebrities seeking to host Saturday Night Live in its early years, Burt Convey stood out. However, his attempt to grace the SNL stage was thwarted as the show's producers rejected his proposal. This intriguing tidbit, chronicled in the book Saturday Night, a backstage history of Saturday Night Live, adds a layer of curiosity to Convey's journey. Within the film, a poetic element takes center stage. Julian Burton, credited with crafting the entire life as a bum poem, skillfully blended imitation and parody of beatnik art. This subtle artistic choice adds a distinct flavor to the film, showcasing Burton's talent and creativity. Unveiling a different facet of the movie, it's worth noting that A Bucket of Blood, despite being a slasher film, carries a comedic and less serious undertone. This deviation from the typical seriousness associated with slasher movies sets it apart as a unique and innovative cinematic venture. In summary, A Bucket of Blood, with its rejection narratives, poetic ingenuity, and comedic slasher approach, stands as a groundbreaking film of its time, contributing to the evolution of cinema. In the 1959 movie A Bucket of Blood, Burt Convey served as a mentor and friend to Mark Summers. Additionally, Ed Nelson, who appeared in the film, is the father of Christopher's Nelson, Director Roger Corman and writer Charles B. Griffith immerse themselves in the coffeehouse culture of the Sunset Strip to develop the beatnik characters for the movie. They conducted research to accurately portray the subculture, contributing to the film's authenticity. This approach allowed them to create memorable characters that added depth to the storyline. Their dedication to capturing the essence of the beatnik movement shines through in the finished product. 